Hi, and welcome to The Journey. I'm Michael, your host, and today we're going to be talking about pet emergencies. Are you ready? We've talked about them being on the road, but what about in your own neighborhood? We're going to be breaking it down with Jen and Sarah, so stay tuned. Thanks. My name is Jen. I'm in Southern California, dog walker, uh, pet sitter, and dog trainer, and part of um, the importance of (laughs) talking today is, uh, you know, just keeping everybody safe and um, our pets, us, um, and, you know, dealing with the, the things that may come at us during walks or, uh, you know, in the backyard or even at a park and all those kind of things. So um, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm all about the safety. Yeah, and you are. And I really appreciate that you're here and, you you know, because we were going to jump into a different frame of conversation today. And then last week you said, Oh no, let's talk more about this. And so I'm happy that you brought this up because I think it's such an important topic so that we can understand what goes on around us as well. Cause like, just like as in a car accident, most car accidents happens within seven miles of our house, something like that. Um, with that, I would love for Sarah to say hello to the room. Hello. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for letting me be here. And, um, my name is Sarah, as you said, um, well, I'm not super close to the border, <laughs> but I am in North County. I'm in a little town called Vista in Southern California, uh, about seven miles from the ocean. And um, I help new puppy owners train their pups so they can get started with confidence and ease um, and know that their puppy will thrive no matter what the circumstance. So thankful to be here in emergencies. I find that we kind of try to just focus on these things like, gosh, when the 4th of July in the U.S. approaches or you know, summer hits, but safety is uh, important to be prepared for um, all the time, just in case something happens when we don't expect it. So I love this topic. Thanks, Michael. You're welcome, Sarah. Jen, so let's kick it off. I you want to start with you. You're a dog walker. You probably get encountered in many different situations where it can be an emergency or it can be dangerous. What do you see the most in your everyday practice? Well, where we are, we're pretty famous for our bear activity um, and deer, coyotes, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and, you know, the last, it's so weird. Like we come, we go in waves of like not having any loose or stray dogs um, and having pleasant walks. And all of a sudden everybody's out and nobody has a collar or tag. Nobody's a microchip. So we kind of deal with all of that stuff. Um year round honestly lately uh so those are the those are the most common things that we we find are other animals um while we're walking or out with our dogs well you and i can imagine the loose dogs are a big concern because if you have your dog on a leash and there's a bunch of loose dogs around you how do you control that what's your first safety go-to well you know, I kind of assess the dog that's coming at us, and if if they're just kind of moseying around, not really bothered by us walking walking by or whatever, we'll just kind of keep our distance and make sure that the dog that I've got on the leash isn't going to go nuts. Um, you know, like most dogs we we are walking right now are a little bit reactive, um, and so that's that's a tough one when you have a reactive dog. Um, so we, we always carry like a pocket full of kibble. Uh, some people will call, carry um, kibble and some rocks, like not big rocks, just some stones just to make noise on the ground or the sidewalk. But also the kibble is good to like, or, you know, any kind of food that is heavy enough that it's going to carry some weight and go a distance. Um, that sort of will distract them. Hopefully, this is like an ideal situation, right, um, to buy us some time and give us some space. And, and then usually by that point, things are kind of done. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just one small situation. I'd be curious to, to hear if Sarah has any suggestions on stuff like that. Um, just based on, like, the dog that we have, like, how, how can we, other than controlling the dog on our leash, what can we do? I don't know. So maybe being prepared for those situations um, with the dog that's on the end of the leash. I'd love to hear what Sarah has to say on that. Yeah. Um, again, I, I like what Jen said. It's important to assess the situation. Um, 
I just heard uh, a really, I won't go into details, but I, I heard an awful story the other day about a dog off leash. It turned out to be a puppy and someone took extreme measures because the dog was off leash and sadly the dog lost his life. So sometimes I think um, we're not assessing the situation. It's really important to make sure that um, we're perceiving um, whether or not it's going to be a, a, an actual threat. Um, and, and knowing body language too, whether the dog is approachable, if it is an off leash dog and we're looking to help that dog or we're with our own dog that needs safety and space. Um, so I, my first go to to answer your question, Michael, is always to protect my dog and to throw treats is my first one. Um, usually at the dog's head, um, for safety because that's gonna, or the dog's body because it's gonna probably pounce off their head and make them think about looking down to the ground. Um, and I like the pebble idea to add noise and distraction. I hadn't heard that before, so that's a great tip as well. I do know um, some dog um, folk recommend, you know, carrying like a citronella spray um, in case of an emergency only. This is not something that you would use on a day-to-day -day basis with your dog as that is an aversive. But if you're in an extreme situation, whether you're running alone or you're walking your dog, right? Um, and that's something that you're worried about. Um, it's not something that's going to injure the other dog. Um, so that's something that you could consider as well. So let's let's back up a little bit and let's talk about what you guys keep bringing up is off-leash dogs. What is an off-leash dog, Jen? Well, any dog without a leash. Ha, 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 ha. Smart ass. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something more witty than that, but there really isn't anything, right? Like, it's just literally a dog off leash. Without it, most of the time without a human or the human is far away and they're not really managing their dog, right? Like exactly. And I, a lot of dogs, well, a lot of dogs in our area don't have humans attached. But, you know, like when you get up into the hiking trails and on um, some of the walking paths, some people do let their dogs off leash and they're you know, a quarter of a mile back. Like, that's not really okay for the average pet parent who's who, or the average dog owner who's just out for a walk with their dog, you know, because they don't know. They don't, they can't see that the dog is on voice control. Like, there's no visual that says, that's going to tell me, even as a professional dog walker and dog trainer, like, how do I know if your dog is on voice control? If I see a happy golden retriever charging at us to play, and I've got my deaf girl beans with me, like she's going to try to kill him, right? Like she's, she's not about that. Like don't come near her. And so I think that um, the dogs who are on voice control, who are, don't have an owner within a quarter of a mile and they can call them back quickly and they do that, for me, that's not a problem, right? But that's, you know, obviously against the law. There are leash laws everywhere, as far as I know. Um, you know, so it's, just kind of like, ooh, that's, that's a tough one to, to answer. I ask because what you're talking about, voice control. So there are dogs that are trained to be off leash. That's where I was going with this. So when we're talking about these dogs and their owners, do you find that when you guys are out in these areas that the owners aren't being responsible with their off leash dogs and it's just kind of like a party for all? Or are most dogs that are off leash with their owners, the owners are being responsible? Or do you find that there's just a, just a crazy mix that you can't put your finger on it? What do you think, Sarah? I think for the most part, most off leash dogs, their owners want their dogs to be really perfect off leash and they don't have a solid recall and they're not paying attention to their dog and they are yelling, my dog is friendly. And they're not thinking about the other dog owner and their dog. And, um, yeah, so I think there's, there's a mixed bag, of course. We don't want to fault those that are doing really great jobs with their pups and um, training them really well to stay focused on them and, and have a really solid recall. Um, but there are a lot of dogs out there that um, are so inundated by the distractions in the environment, they're, they're not going to respond to – I had a lady – they're not going to respond to the owner. I mean, I had a lady that um, I was walking a very fearful, reactive dog, and we we're in the neighborhood. And and mind you, this was a small dog that was approaching us, but it kept barking and closing in the space. And I, I yelled at the owner several times, my dog needs space. Can you please come get your dog? And she stood in the driveway about 
50 yards or whatever away and just kept yelling at her dog. And her dog was like, I don't care what you're saying. I'm going to go bark at this dog. And I was very concerned because I knew my dog that I was handling would uh, escalate and it wasn't going to be pretty. So I ended up throwing treats at this dog, but I had to yell at the owner several times and we had to run into the house because the lady didn't do anything. So, you know, people have good intentions, but at the same time, we need to take action. And if you're, if your dog is not responding to you, something needs to change. So I think the, there is a mix of dogs that respond and dogs that, uh, you know, they assume is, are just going to come back to them because they, it's their environment and they'll come back when they're ready, but it's just not responsible in my opinion. Jen, do you have any, anything to offer on that? If I could have moved my thumb any faster to clap at every word that you just said, Sarah, I would have, but I, my fast, my thumb's a little fast, so that doesn't really work out for me so much. Um, but I agree with everything, 100%, Sarah just said. You know, for the, for the most part, in our neck of the woods, in my neck of the woods, um, it's, it's mostly the irresponsible dog owners uh, that we encounter. Um, and, and that's unfortunate because there are so many dogs who are voice control trained, right? And, and they're perfectly fine being off leash. And their owners are responsible about it. If they see another dog ahead, they call their dog back immediately or, you know, make sure to give, give everyone the space that they need. And they, they are responsive when we say something. Um, they recognize the signs that the dog that we may be walking, that we're walking may be uh, reactive or, you know, needs to go slow and needs to have space, um, you know, yellow ribbons, you know, that kind of stuff. So there are, there are a bunch of different ways that we as, as um, dog owners with reactive dogs can signal um, other dog owners, you know, that we have that kind of dog. And I think that the responsible dog owners, whether they're on leash, having their dog on leash or off leash under voice control, I think that they, they're aware of those things and they, they really pay attention. Um, you know, it's, it's the other kind of dog walkers <laughs> who just, you know, let their dogs out like Tara was talking about um, that, those really aren't welcome in my world. Um, they, they usually cause some problems for us. Um, and they usually cause problems for the dogs that we walk. Uh, so that's why I'm just like, oh, gosh, it's so annoying, right? I'm glad we're talking about this today. Thanks for letting me vent a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's also, oh. it definitely sounds like it's a good space for you today, Jen, to be here. Sarah, what were you going to jump in and say? I was just thinking on the safety thing too. Um, this isn't for all dogs because lots of dogs walk great on collars, um, you know, traditional buckle collars, but um, sometimes um, collars aren't fit properly and dogs slip out of them, which can cause an off leash dog as well. Um, or even when we're not talking, so making sure that you're, you're checking the fitting of your dog's collar or make sure that you get a body harness um, for more comfort and um, management would be ideal. Um, but I will also say there, then there's the discussion of retractable leashes, which I am not a fan of, which can cause a lot of dangerous situations as well and um, safety problems. So I don't know if you agree on that, Jen, or you want to add any tips on that? Do I agree? Of course I agree. Oh my gosh. Um, just keep going, Sarah. I'm, I'm with you 100%. Uh, yeah, proper fitting gear and um, safe gear <laughs> is super important. Um, and if you have to have a collar and a harness on a dog for whatever reason, you know, like some people don't like harnesses, some people don't like to have collars on their dogs for whatever reason, or some people can't have one or the other for, you know, health reasons for their dogs or whatever. Um, for me, I like to have uh, harness and collar together and the collar is always like a tag collar or you know a martindale because i have whip it um, and their heads are like little pea heads and their necks are thick so they have to have a collar that tightens a little bit um but not a choke chain different different thing altogether. um and so i attach the collar to the harness uh and Vinny's my only one who needs a harness that really helps him. and so i attach the two to add extra safety so that they can't possibly, if they get spooked, they can't possibly back out of a harness and a collar at the same time. It's impossible. We've been doing this for 30 years and attaching collars to harnesses with a carabiner is pretty much 100%. We have never had any accidents 
never had any slipped harness and collars together. We've had a couple of slipped collars, broken collars, broken leashes, and broken harnesses um, when dogs pull and their gear isn't quite up to par. Um, so there's all those things that we need to check before we go out every single time. Um, and the owners are responsible for, you know, for checking that gear. It's not the gear company, it's you. <laughs> so be that responsible person and make sure that your dog's gear, whatever that may look like, um, is, is awesome. And it's, it's not, you know, cracked or damaged in any way, whether it's the weather or, um, you know, some dogs like the sun and the sun will change that, uh, that collar. It will age it, uh, rapidly. So just, Check, check your gear and also retractable leashes. Oh my gosh, how many times have we all seen the little tiny dog 25 feet out in front of the owner? We think it's off leash because you can't even see the string it's attached to and the owner's on the phone, not even paying attention. Um, I've seen a dog run into the street and almost get hit. I've seen dogs get hit on retractable leash. Um, there's absolutely no care and control involved in that retractable lead in that situation. Are they, are they a good piece of equipment for some people? Maybe. I think if you know how to use it, sure. And I've used them and I'm good at it, but I don't recommend them for anybody walking a dog, honestly. Like even myself, I'm not going to use it to walk my dog. Okay, rant over. Next. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, no, but it's it's important that we're talking about the leashes and the different uses for them because I've heard the retractable is really good to have a long lead if you're training them in a field or something like that. But maybe on a walk, you really want to have a tight, closer leash to you. Um, and that's a big emergency. I want to say I want to bring that to our attention here is that we're talking about emergencies is what do you do if you're walking a dog, Jen, or maybe you're walking two dogs and one does slip their collar and they get away from you? In that emergency, what's your plan? It depends on the dog. Um, first, I would hope that that wouldn't happen. But if it ever does happen, uh, and it happened to a, a little dog who came in for training, and she was afraid to come up the stairs her first time. Um, I didn't know that it was the first time out of the house because the client wasn't um, forthright with me. Um and the dog had a harness on that was a little bit too loose. Dog slips the harness, takes off up the sidewalk, and the owner starts running. I'm like, you need to stop. <laughs> so my thing is stop and wait for your dog to turn around if it's, you know, again, it depends so much on the dog. And I'm sure Sarah's going to have a lot to offer in this, in this, on this question. Um, for this little dog, she was so scared and so attached to her mom that I knew that she would come back. I knew that she would be like, oh, crap, what have I done? Where am I going? And that's exactly what happened. And so I asked the woman, just sit down. Can you sit down and just wait? Just wait. And the dog is looking at the grass, not interested, tail between the legs, kind of circling and circling, um, and just kind of like just freaking out, like I don't even know what to do or where to go. And I said, call your dog. She called her, and the dog got closer, and she couldn't get the dog. And the reason is because, and this is where I want Sarah to chime in, uh, the reason she couldn't catch the dog, and the dog was right in front of her, is because every time she had called the dog in the house, she was doing something to the dog, putting something that the dog didn't want on the dog, um, or cleaning its ears, or cleaning its eyes, or touching its feet, or like doing things that the dog hated. Um, and so she wasn't practicing a decent name game or recall. And that's why the dog was like, well, why would I come to you even though I'm right here? I'm not going to let you pick me up. You're going to do something. So that's like a whole other thing, right? But that's what I do. I stop. I get low. I'm like, come on, let's go. Make it fun. Sometimes run backwards, the opposite direction. Depends on the dog. All right, Sarah, it's all you. <laughs> Wow. I mean, you nailed it. Stop, get low, make it fun, go in the opposite direction, slow down. Yeah. I mean, all of that. And then, <laughs> I mean, yeah. And then you could use food too, but you nailed it too on the associations. If you're a dog and oftentimes this is happening without us realizing unbeknownst to you, you may be causing an unpleasantry um, in your dog's 
um, environment when you were calling them. Um, I've had lots of pups I've, at, at a very young age that, you know, young kids just want to love on these puppies and they're reaching and they're grabbing and they're picking up the puppies. And when I get into the house, I'm realizing this puppy doesn't want to be handled because every time you reach for them, that hand means they're going to be grabbed and they're going to be picked up, even though you're loving on them, they're not fond of it. So we really need to pay attention to what that hand means to the dog. Oftentimes I find as well, dogs are being chased for fun, right? In the backyard, kids are chasing the doggy. We always want to play the game of the dog following us, which is why Jen said, move away in the opposite direction. Um, and movement helps encourage our dogs to orient better to us. So the last thing you want to do is, you know, square up your shoulders and, you know, cause this picture of intimidation, like you better get over here or else kind of attitude. So um, when you asked Michael, like, what, what would you do if this happened? And Jen's like, well, I, I would hope that this didn't, doesn't happen. And uh, I said in my head, I was like, call him to come because I've trained a really good recall. Um, but yeah, so then going back to the drawing board and, and assessing, you know, wow, what can I, what do I need to work on? And hopefully it doesn't take a scare like this for someone to be motivated to, to practice an emergency recall and what that looks like piece by piece. Back to you, Michael. I think what we're talking about here is so important about the training step by step. We talk about that all the time about just getting your dog prepared for these situations. And unfortunately, there's a lot of dogs out there that haven't had that awareness or that training to be able to have that recall. Let's jump to this. We're talking about emergencies again here. So Jen, Sarah, whoever wants to take this first, you could jump into it. What do you guys do when you are walking a dog and another dog's off leash and comes charging at you and starts to get in a fight with your dog? What's your reaction? What's your plan? About being prepared if you are ready for, um, if you if you are frequently in an area where you think that you might encounter a dog off leash that's going to cause a fight, um, being prepared, like we said earlier, with having something to redirect, toss treats, having maybe a citronella stop spray handy. Um, Again, you never want to put your hands in the mix, um, yelling at the owner, uh, you know, if they're nearby. Um, but again, having having a dog fight discussion break up is, is definitely a, uh, a whole nother room. So what do we so what other emergencies are we going to face on the road around our neighborhood? What I was talking about earlier is like Jen lives in a different area than you do. And I think you have a lot of like open areas, open uh, homes with a lot of property. What other emergencies do you encounter, Sarah? Um, I, gosh, I mean, I think for us, a lot of it is, we talked about this a few weeks ago, is the heat on the ground um, and making sure um, that we're paying attention just to the surrounding environments as well. Um, and making sure that we're not placing our dog in a situation where, um, and, and knowing knowing what our dog looks like while they're walking so we can pay attention. I've seen so many dogs out where they're limping and the owner is not paying attention to that, whether they're burning their feet or um, maybe they've got a burr. We have a lot of foxtails here in San Diego when things get dry, kind of during fire season. So paying attention to those things out on walks can be really important, especially if you're going out on the trails. We also talked a couple of weeks ago about the importance of making sure our dogs are hydrated. Um, so not regarding other dogs um, or necessarily wildlife, but paying attention to those, you know, the health of our dog. As far as wildlife, you know, we do have a lot of coyotes out here. Um, I know there are um, protective gear um, that, you know, for little dogs, um, we don't want to just, you know, keep our, well, there's also birds of prey, too, that can snatch up little dogs or cats. So it's really important that we're we're observing where we're going and making sure our, um, we are prepared to keep our dog safe in those environments. It's really like preparing your dog on the walk, making sure they're set up to win, their collar's tight, their leash is tight, you don't have a long leash, and you're aware of your surroundings and what's coming at you. And if something, I like the idea that you're talking about is like having a handful of food in case someone, another dog does approach you, you can distract them with that. What about the emergency that you have with the other pet owner in an argument about their dogs? How do you deescalate that on your walk? I mean, because that happens all the time. You see two people walking and all of a sudden two owners of their dogs and they're screaming at each other for some reason or another because one dog did another thing or to the other dog. I mean, I think that's kind of like another emergency that we put our dogs through and it's a stress that we put our dogs through. So how do you avoid that, Sarah? Um, I try to stay, at, you know, as a positive trainer, I try to stay as positive as possible while educating. 
Um, you know, I am constantly scanning my environment when I'm with a dog, whether it's my dog or somebody else's dog. And, um, I, I'm, I am ahead predicting and anticipating the poor choices that other dog owners may be making. Um, and if I notice that my dog is getting encroached upon by another person, for example, or a person with a dog, um, I'm either going to go my other way peacefully, or um, if I'm kind of trapped, I'm going to kindly put my hand out and say, um, I'm sorry, are you coming this way? I just need some space. Can I pass through first? Do you mind if you put your dog on leash? My dog needs some space, things like that. Um, I I do not argue. Um, I'm going to let them win. I'm going to walk away. It's not worth my energy um, to focus on the negative, someone like that. I just want to focus on keeping myself and my dog safe. Spot on, Sarah. You know, taking the high road is always the best route to go. Let's check to see if we have any questions in our room today. If you have a question about what we're talking about, if you had have an emergency and you didn't know how to handle it or something's triggered you in our conversation and you want to add to some conversation that we've had, please raise your hand. I invite you up to the stage to speak with us. I'm speaking with Sarah. She's a trainer here in Southern California, works a lot with puppies and behavior. Sarah, with all that you do with the dogs and working with the, the clients that you work with, how do you get them prepared to be the best parent, the safest parent on their journey of dog training? Yeah, I mean, start training right away and think about, you know, what their goals are for what they want to do with their dog. Why did they get a dog in the first place? Mm -hmm. And um, plan to set that pup up for success from the get go and, and stay positive with the training. Find the support of a certified trainer if they need help and not going so fast. You know, it's, it takes time and not inundating our dogs, young or old, with too much environmental stimuli at first, but going their pace and letting them tell us when they're ready to progress. Well, I think going at their pace is like the biggest key that you said there is like so important. It's like really we talk about this all the time, baby steps, baby steps. And the more you set your dog up to win, the better it's going to be for you, just not for now, but for later. Um, once again, if anybody in the room has any questions or you have any thoughts or ideas what we're talking about, about emergency safety with your dog on the road, on the streets, in your neighborhood, what to expect what can we do differently to make them safe? Uh, Sarah, so we're talking about emergencies. What else haven't I touched on with you or what else would you like to share about pet emergencies? Well, I think, you know, so many people just go out on walks without anything. I think it's really important. You know, if you left the house to go do an errand, you're going to bring your wallet, your keys, your ID, right? So I think making sure that we have some sort of system in place to um, carry some treats and carry um, information, whether it's about your dog on their ID tag or with you about yourself. I mean, I go running and I have an ID tag on like an emergency contact and my blood type and, you know, you just can never be too safe. Um, Jen, as a, a professional dog walker, she carries and our, her team carries, um, you know, extra kibble. They carry uh, a water bottle for cooling off the paw pads of dogs, as well as using it as an emergency if a dog is coming at them. So there are lots of different things that we can do to be prepared. They even carry an extra slip lead in case they do find a friendly dog off leash that they can manage. But I think being, being safe means paying attention, right? Just like you're driving down the road. You got to pay attention to your surroundings and what's happening so you can anticipate and you can be proactive instead of reactive. Yeah, and I think that's a big thing that we talk about too, is be proactive. Look ahead of the game versus wait for the game you know, to be over and go, what just happened? Just really just keep your eye on your dog. Know your dog. Know your dog's um, behavior and what's going on with your dog. Um, what are the things, talking about emergencies, and we're just talking about all these different things that happen with your dogs. Jen, are you back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. You, you sound clear. Perfect. So Jen, we've been talking about everything emergency and all. I asked Sarah this while you were out. Is there anything emergency wise that you encounter as a dog walker or anything that you would like to bring up that we haven't brought up? We always carry treats, kibble, a um, little bit of pebbles, um, all those things. And also a, a slip lead just in case we do encounter 
a friendly off-leash dog who's not threatening and the dog we're walking is fine and we can help that little one out. Um, you know, we, we do carry that extra leash. Um, and then just to always make sure that you have whatever you need for that dog that you're walking. Um, and that sometimes, most of the time, we will actually carry a water bottle in a sling over our shoulder so that, um, you know, the dog can either have a drink. And most of the time, dogs aren't going to need to drink because we only have them out for 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and they, they're just so excited about sniffing and doing all the fun stuff we do with them on walks that they're not interested in drinking until we get back. But having that water in a sling, um, no matter if it's a stainless steel water bottle, plastic or whatever, just a regular water bottle, um, it can turn into something that you can use to defend yourself if you have to. So if a dog is not friendly at all and is really coming for you and there's no time to do much else, um, you can, uh, you know, use that sling water bottle combo as a little bit of a weapon. And I hate to say that, um, because I don't want that to be the norm. Um, but I would love to just share that, that, uh, you know, having, having at least one free hand too, when you're walking a dog is super, super important and making sure that you don't have anything that is, um, impeding your, your use of your hands, um, that's been like the number one thing that our dog walkers uh, always double check as they're walking out the door with the dog, that the only thing in their hand is the leash. That's it. Um, nothing else goes in the hand. We use fanny packs, pockets, over-the-shoulder carrier things. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we do as professionals. I And I, you know, strongly... I feel really strongly about the whole flexi thing. Um, the, the handle is just inhibiting and that kind of thing. So I, I just can't, can't see any of us ever carrying anything like that in our hands. And it's just not a safe tool to use. So anyway, that's all I have to say about uh, dog walking safety. Maybe Sarah probably covered a lot of that. Sarah, what's your thoughts? One of the things you kept repeating was, Hands, 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 hands free. This is really, really important. It's also with regards to safety. Um, and aside from just holding the leash, I was yelling out loud, and a clicker, and a clicker in under you, under your thumb as well. Um, if you are using a clicker to train, or at least a, you've got your verbal marker to reward your pup for getting what you would like right. Um, but I was going to say, yeah, that going back to the retractable leash, it's so cumbersome. And if you accidentally drop it, boy, that can send a fearful dog running. And um, the other tip I wanted to just share is placement of hands. Um, I think we often are so relaxed when the dog is just doing really well walking that we're not paying attention to the environment, which is also something we need to work on. But very quickly, a dog can pull you off your feet and face plant yourself onto the ground. So making sure you're paying attention to where your hands are um, is really important because if you keep your elbows tucked to your side and your hands at your waist or your belly, you're going to have more control to stay balanced in your body than if your hand was pulled straight out from under you out, outright. Not only would you be reinforcing pulling, but you quickly can get pulled off of your feet. So I think paying attention to our, our own body is really important as well. Yeah, that balance is so, I agree. Jen? I, can I just add one more thing on this one? Um, so, and I don't know that most people know this. Almost every leash is designed to work against itself. So when we are working on our team training, uh, with which includes like dog walking 101 all the way up to you know 110 like we're always learning something new and uh, so with the leashes depending on the type of leash like the the biothane leashes are my favorite because they are a little bit uh, they're soft and they're very strong there's actually a metal core in those um, or a very strong wire core in those so they may look flimsy, but they're very, very strong little leashes. Um, those, if you, you know, any leash, the tension is, the leashes are designed designed to um, work with tension against themselves. 
So even just putting the leash together between your thumb and forefinger, I'm going to try and take a picture of this before we leave. But um, it, you, if you just hold the leash so that in one hand uh, and, and hold it in a way that has tension against itself, like I, I'm just going to have to show a picture, but um, that is the best way to hold a leash. Because all you have to do is just tighten your hand, and that leash isn't going anywhere. Um, so anyway, that's just an aside. I'm going to take a picture for you. I always say make a bunny ear and stick your thumb or your forefinger through that ear, the loop, and then pull that down tight on your finger, and then grab the rest of the leash with your hand and make a fist, if you can picture that. Hopefully that's what you were trying to describe. What do you think, Jen? Is that kind of pretty much the same thing you're describing? Kind of. <laughs> we just don't hold a lot of leash in our hand. We can't have, um, we just have to use like maybe a couple of loops. Um, and I- I'm just going to have to take a picture. I'm, I'm very visual. So for me to picture what Sarah just said, I think it's exactly the same, but I'm not sure. I love that. Yeah. And it's not safe to wrap your hand um, with the leash. So. Um, you want to be able to quickly release the dog um, or not get dragged down. Um, and I know there's some political debate on this because everybody wants to protect their dog. Um, but there is a way. I mean, one of the first things we teach our clients is the mechanics of how to hold a leash without the dog. Well, there's so many different avenues that we're talking about here about protecting your dog, protecting you, being in balance, being in harmony with your dog is so important on your walk as well. Jen, you being a dog walker and you're going to your clients' homes, do you guys ever encounter where the dog's been really super nice and is excited to see you when you're coming in and then all of a sudden the dog has a whole new personality and they're being a little attackful? And you're like, how do we walk this dog? What are we going to do with this dog? What, what do you do there? Do you, how do you work with that dog? And where do you go from there? I might have missed a word in there. It sounded like you said the dog was attacking us. Well, <laughs> I think can, I got- well let's, say, let's say you go up to a, a client's house and all of a sudden you're, you're unlocking the door and you've got the key. They're not home. And the dog that you normally walk is there. And just normally is always really, really sweet. But for some reason, something triggered them and they're just really aggressive. What do you, you know, do you just close the door, leave the dog alone, come back a little bit? And do you try to de-escalate the dog? What do you do? Well, I can honestly say that's never happened. Um, But if that were to happen, I would want my dog walker to keep themselves safe and just shut the door and call me. Um, (laughs) And then I go over and and assess the situation. And I also call the owner. Um, So, you know, I think it's situational dependent and dog dependent. I really... Um, that just hasn't happened to us. And there are so many management um, management tools in place um, so that we don't encounter that with the dogs that we walk, whether there's baby gates, X-pens, or crates, um, or yards, or for example. Um, that just, that's not a thing that we would, we would uh, you know, handle solo without the owner being aware. And then we would just talk with them, so... Jen, what about preparing the dog to go for a walk? Is there anything that you do before? Every dog needs an adventure walk, in my opinion. Uh, like every every dog needs a sniff. Every dog needs those sniffy walks. Um, and so that's kind of what, what we do on our dog walks. Like we don't just like straight walk a dog for a potty break for 15 minutes and call it a day. We're doing all sorts of other things. And, and we encourage the owners to do that when we're not walking the dog as well. So I agree with that for sure. And yeah, absolutely knowing the breed. And I mean, I've got whippets. If they see a bunny, I'm not going to not let them, you know, jump around and get excited because that's what they're going to do. Their, their natural instinct is to go chase that bunny. But if they are jumping around being fools about to hurt themselves or hurt me or catch a bunny, you know, obviously those are things that I don't want them to do, any of those things. And so, um, and also if there are other dogs around, uh, reacting to my dog, that's not really fair to them either. So society as a whole deserves, <laughs> deserves my, uh, you know, my attention to my dog and my responsibility to my dog is to make sure that everybody's okay. Um, and my responsibility to society as well, um, without pressure of, you know, other people, you know, judging me or anything, but 
that that doesn't exist in my world. Um, it's all about making sure everybody is happy and safe as much as humanly possible. And if that means that I carry a toy that has fur like a bunny and a squeaker and I go the opposite direction of that bunny to keep my dog interested because that's what he likes to do, um, then, yeah, absolutely. Let's use the breed. Let's use what they were bred to do um, in our crave, right? Yeah, and I think, again, we, you know, definitely reaching out to the support of a, a certified trainer to, to assist in all of these wonderful tools to help guide our puppies to build relationships with us and trust and confidence and all of that is really, really important. Um, back to you, Michael. Everybody has their way of training their dogs. Everyone, you know, if you're not a trainer, you're you're doing whatever you can. You're reading whatever books you can. And what we say here in the rooms and with all the trainers and everybody that comes up and gives their opinion or their thoughts or suggestions and all that, it's you have to remember if you're in the room, this is their thoughts. This is the way they work. This is how they work with their clients. This is how they work with their dogs. This is how they train. And the magic is is that if you can identify and connect with one of the people that we have in our rooms that's a trainer and you're looking for a trainer, there's so many options today that you can even do online training with them. But always look at look at everybody. See what works for you because like what we're talking about here too, like what Jen was like talking about her whip it and you know, they're raised to chase rabbits and rabbits are a big toy for them. And it's like really understanding your breed and understanding your who your dog is for you and who they are for them and who you are with your dog, your relationship with your dog is so important. And then you can actually start to look at who's the best trainer for you. Who's what, what information really resonates with you. I think it's also important. I do want to start closing out the room right now. I'm Michael, your host here today in the pet emergency with Sarah and Jen. And we're talking about emergencies on the road, walking your dogs, what to do, how to handle it, different situation scenarios and all that. And really it comes down to taking your time with your dog, get to know your dog, train your dog, 101 baby steps on like how to be on a leash, how to go on a walk. There's This is all, once you get this down and once you start working with your dogs and you get them trained in the right way, this is going to set you up for success for your life. So that's the one thing I want to say there. And with that, I would like to say thank you for everybody for joining us today for this conversation with Jen and Sarah about emergency and safety inside your own home, your yard, your neighborhood, wherever you go. Always remember safety first. I'm Michael, your host. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon. I'm out.